So first of all, let me start off saying the first thing that you really need to make an organization or a new startup work is you have to make the conscious decision to be on all the time. And I'm going to talk about that. What does it mean to be on all the time? Well, first of all, I think a lot of people start an organization uh, as a side hustle, hoping, you know, while they're doing whatever else they're doing, this might blow up. But rarely does an organization really take off unless it is really your total focus. Now, what that really means is that failure is not an option. You really have to be at a point where when you jump into this, it can't be a side gig that you hope might, if everything goes well, turn out your way. That sort of commitment means that you have to be on all the time. Now, you may have another job at, when you're first starting this out. You may be focused on a few other things, but rarely do you see a, 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 an organization, a new startup take off without the principal founder being all in, meaning they don't really have a whole lot that they're focused on except for that. Of course, we all have our family and God and, and other priorities in life. And so that doesn't mean it's to the exclusion of that, but it does mean it has to be a right time in your life where you can you know, put a significant portion of your time in that endeavor. And what that really means is to be on all the time. That means, you know, whether it's nights, weekends, it doesn't mean you're working, but it does mean that you're always on and and working on your business at, at least on some subconscious, conscious level at all times. We don't want you to micromanage. We want you to micro mentor, okay, which is different. Micromanaging is where you hover over and read every email and cross check, you know, double check everything uh, your staff does, and or you know want detailed input of everything, uh, every little process of what's going on in everyone's workday. That sometimes is confused with micro mentoring, which is to be there for them to go over the hard interactions, the tough emails that they have to go through, the tough vendor relationships, client management. You know, if you bring someone on board and this is your field and your industry and you're the Michael Jordan of, of this industry, it's your job to impart some of that. And what does that also mean? That means investing time and energy. I see so many senior leaders hire someone. Oh, we just hired a director of marketing. You know what? If you just hired a director of marketing, you may have to spend several hours, maybe five, 10 hours a week, the first few months with that person to kind of not necessarily hold their hands, but give them advice, give them the insight. Well, listen, that client, this is the way they like to be taken care of. You know, we've tried this in the past. We tried an e-marketing strategy, email marketing strategy last year. That worked, that didn't work. But let me tell you, you know, how I see it. I think investing in your senior leadership, especially in the first few to six, few months, first six months, pays dividends beyond what you can imagine. Remember, Google has to crawl billions of websites every week, every month. If it takes them you know, 10 hours to crawl your website, they're not going to do it. They're going to leave. And believe me, when they leave, they don't index what they didn't get to. So what's interesting is you have to also find out, did Google, was, able, was Google able to crawl my whole website? Did they run into problems? And if they did, did they leave? Because the bot that Google sends has a limited amount of time. And we call that again, without getting too technical, your crawl budget, okay? Your Google crawl budget. So you have a, just like anything else, you have a budget for food, you have a budget for this, you have a budget for that. Well, you, <laughs> your website has a budget, okay? And Google is gonna give it a budget. We're only, like The bot's coming in for, for 10 minutes. Uh, whether we figure out your website or not, that's up to you, but we're leaving because we got a billion other websites to check out uh, later today. So again, I'm, I don't know if any of these numbers are accurate. This is just to kind of give you a sense of the problem at hand and how you can be in front of it. One of the things that you quickly learn as a CEO, as a leader, for example, is different people you know, digest information differently. So you may want to say 
the same thing to three different people in your organization. And believe it or not, to each person, you may have to serve up the same information differently. So you're going to say the exact same thing, but knowing how that person digests information, having worked with them, allows you to calibrate how you speak with them, right? So there's certain staff, for example, that you know, can walk into my office and I can just be direct. I can say, listen, you know that last report? Here's here's three things that were wrong with it and let's try to fix it. Okay, that's person A. Another person may walk in and say, hey, you know that report? Let me tell you the five great things I liked about it. Boom, 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 boom. But here's three areas that, well, I don't know, what do you think? Do you think there's some areas of improvement that we can have on these three? Both those scenarios, we, we essentially said the same thing, right? There's three areas that need to be improved. But sometimes you have to understand how people are going to digest information. And again, that becomes, you know, when people say he's a savvy leader or he's a very considerate leader or she's a considerate leader or she's a great leader, some of that involves those interpersonal skills and to be able to calibrate how you serve up information, how you digest information from different people. You know, even how you hear information from one person. You know, you know if somebody says something, you know, that may seem, you know, a little jarring, but you know who it came from, you know, to digest it a different way versus someone else. So these skills are things that you need to pass on as a mentor to your for sure, senior leadership and whoever else that you you are you have the opportunity to work with. So once you get that, let's talk about then um, what happens when they give you their terms. Well, first of all, let's talk about concessions. Okay, so when whenever you hear all the terms that you're going to be thrown at, the one thing that I have often found is find terms that you know what what appears like a concession to them, you didn't even want anyway. So certain aspects of their offer are going to be things you can certainly live without. However, you can make it sound like you're willing to make those concessions. And the best way to make a concession is by a strategy called if-then. So if someone says, you know, these are our terms, Uh, this is like a 36-month deal, blah, 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 blah. And you can live with 36 months. But if you were then say, well, listen, 36 months, okay, that's a long time. But let me ask you a question. If we could live with 36 months, do you think we could get the payments plan to be spread out over five months? So basically, it's a strategy of if then. So if you're going to agree, never just say, fine, we're okay with 36 months. If you're going to be okay with 36 months, instead of saying, we're okay with 36 months, the strategy is to say, if we can live with 36 months, and then can you blah, blah, blah. Does this make sense? So it's a if then, if then. So whatever you're going to concede to, I wouldn't just say, oh, we're okay with that. I would say, if we could, then could you. If we could do this, then could you do that. If we did this, then could you do that. And actually, that, that appeals to people's sense of fairness, right? Saying, you know, if I could do this, then could you do that in exchange? And I think as you're making concessions with things that you can, you can live without, then you can start adding the things that you actually really, really need if that makes sense. So obviously, if they get to a deal killer one, that's going to be tough. But if you've had a series of concessions that you've already agreed to, and then you finally say, ah, on that one, we don't have any room, you're going to sound much more reasonable than if you've been just saying no to everything. So again, you need to know before the meeting starts what you can concede, okay? And you want to concede to the things you can live without, but with every concession, you want to extract something that you absolutely need. Before you decide someone you're bringing on board or approaching someone who's already in your organization about having more of an owner's mentality, there are a couple of things you need to kind of ask yourself, either when you're interviewing them or when you are going to approach them. You know, you have to understand where are they in their lives 
you know, I know there have been certain times in my life where I just wanted a job. You know, I, I was going to do a great job. I'm going to clock in. I'm going to clock out. But I just needed a job. And it didn't mean I was going to do a fantastic job. It just meant that this wasn't going to be, you know, the place I was going to retire or the place that meant the whole world to me. Uh, you know, if the company did well, it did well. If it didn't do well, you know, whatever. Well, I'm going to do a good job, but that's it. And there have been stages in my life. So a lot of times when you're approaching someone or interviewing, this becomes a little difficult, but you have to figure out where are they in, in their lives. And, you know, what does this job mean to them? I know I've taken jobs where I knew this is simply a stepping stone until I got the job I really wanted or the career I really wanted. And it's hard to go to someone who it's the wrong time time in their lives. For example, they're going through a lot of personal stuff or this is job is not really where they eventually want to be or even the organization they want to be in. And then say, hey, I'd like you to become an owner. So before you ask people to become owners, you have to understand those kinds of things. Are they qualified or meaning are they a stage in their lives where ownership actually is even possible? Because obviously, if it's not, you're going to be banging your head against the wall. So before you approach them or you hire them or you promote them, you have to understand, you know, are they? This may be tricky because very few people during the interview process say, you know what, you caught me. Let me tell you the truth. I'm not really in it to win it. I mean, look, I just need a paycheck right now. Uh, but you caught me, you know, I, this ownership thing, forget that. I mean, no one's going to say that in an interview. So you can't really go up to someone during an interview and say, hey, do you want to be an owner? Is this job going to mean the whole world to you? And can you see yourself being here for a long time? Uh, obviously, you know what, what kind of answers you're going to get during an interview. So, you know, how you get past that and figure that out is challenging. But again, that's going to be the goal to figure out if you've caught them at the right time. When an obstacle is thrown in front of them, they will not necessarily give up and go back and say, oh, I tried to problem solve and it didn't work. There was an obstacle. What happens is certain people, when an obstacle presents them in front, in front of them, they will try to figure out a workaround or some solution. Uh, a great example of this is actually in a kid's movie called uh, A Bug's Life. Uh, it's a very cute children's movie where these talking ants are in a, a straight line like ants do, and all of a sudden a leaf falls in front of the, the lead ant. And, of course, the lead ant just throws up his arm and says, whoa, woe is me, what do I do? And, of course, another ant comes by and says, okay, let's slowly walk around the leaf uh, as a solution. Now, that's obviously a satire, but I think like that. You know, I think like, hey, are people coming to me and saying there's a leaf in the way, or are they coming to me and saying there's a leaf in the way and we've decided to walk around the leaf? Sort of a metaphor for, for how badly do you want to solve the problem. And it was interesting, uh, which we're going to go on in our next thing, I often find that people who often can't solve problems like that would probably do it if they owned the company. Like if you sold them the company, they would then figure out the solution. The third strategy to use when you don't have leverage is try to reverse engineer what a win would look like for this other company or person, right? So be in their shoes. Try Now that you know how their business works, what's, what's important to them, often you need to have a better understanding. And this should direct your, if you're doing a PowerPoint presentation. For example, some companies, a win for them is if they are able to get more market share. So volume might be important to them. Other companies, it's important that they have higher margins. So margins might be important. Some other companies, it's the you know type of business. Oh, we tend to do more you know casual clothing rather than formal clothing. Every business has a sweet spot that they rather be in, and you need to understand that. Other companies only want to work with companies that are rapidly growing versus have already plateaued and are a stable company. They want to roll the dice with more startups. Other companies want to work with companies that are low maintenance. You know, once they get them as a client, they don't have to hold their hands. Sometimes 
It's the reverse. Sometimes they want companies who they have to hold their hands because they can charge more for that. So again, you're reverse engineering for what a win looks like for them, right? Sometimes people want, you know, they're willing to do uh, business with a company that can make a quick decision. You know, like, oh my gosh, you know, every everybody we meet with is a 12, 14 week process. But so their sweet spot is to find clients that, you know, maybe not ideal on other points, but they're ready to make a deal that day. So conveying that in, in the sort of reverse engineering can can make a difference. Some people like to work with companies who are tech savvy versus people who aren't. Again, I'm randomly picking things. Uh, some companies are willing to work with companies that are flexible, that are not rigid, and can make decisions. The decision makers are in the room, and, and they can, if they need to tweak the arrangements, someone can say yes. So there's more, and a lot of these are abstract, but as you create your PowerPoint, you know, on some level, you have to pretend you're them, and what, and you want to highlight the points that is in their sweet spot, and of course, minimize the points that is not going to be a win. So I think a lot, what I see in a lot of these negotiations is people put in the PowerPoint what they need, what's important to them, and they highlight the stuff that matters to them, which, of course, on some level you have to do. But also really highlighting what's going to be a win for this other company is important. Okay, I'm, so I'm not saying mislead or hide, but you may not even know that, you know, the fact that you have good technology and you can integrate with them quickly, you may not even know that that's a pain point for them. And so you don't, you don't even mention it on your PowerPoint. You have to take t- time out, reverse engineer what a win would look like for that other company. So when we talk about uh, driving traffic to your website, the first thing you have to understand is that Google essentially, and we're going to talk about Google, but Bing and you know other uh, search engines do the same thing, but Google controls 95% of the market. So we're we're going to just talk about Google. Now, so the way Google approaches it is they, there's billions of websites out there. And what they want to do is take all those billions of websites and then put them in some sort of order. So when someone searches Google, they will get referred to a website that will help them. So that's how Google makes money, right? Because people want... Google wants them to use their search engine. So what does Google try to do? It tries to look at the person's search and say, what websites could we serve up to this person that will make them want to use Google even more because it's relevant to their search? So what Google is trying to do by scanning these billions of websites is to scan them and say, okay, when someone searches for X, Y, and Z, these are the top 10 websites we're going to show them in this order because we think this is going to be the most relevant to that person's search. So you can reverse engineer this for yourself. So what you want Google to, to understand is the industry you're in, uh, if someone searches for what you do, you want Google to say, okay, to make this person super happy, we're going to put Bob's, you know, pool service company is number one because this person needs pool service in this suburb of this town and this would be the most germane uh, offering. So think like Google and what Google wants to do is Google wants to make the people who are searching happy so more people use Google so Google can make more money. (laughs) So um, indirectly, you know, it will help you if you understand Google's motive. Next one is is something I call create an FBI file on the person or companies. And when I say create an FBI file, it's multifaceted. And what I really mean is know about the persons you're going to be talking to. Know their personalities. Know their LinkedIn profile. Know what charities they work in. Know what high school, college they went to. It may not all be necessary, but the fact that you've done your homework and you understand who they are, what they've done, will go a long way. Often just you know mentioning, oh, I, I saw in, on LinkedIn when you were um, at this other company, you kind of did a similar deal or what have you. The ability to convey that you've put in some time or homework in understanding them is often, you know, people find it as a compliment. People often think that, oh, it's kind of creepy, but 
anything you would find on a LinkedIn profile is not creepy. That's actually professional. And so when someone says, hey, I saw on LinkedIn that you were head of marketing at this other company, you know, most people say, oh, that's very professional that you noticed that. And it shows that you've invested in time and energy. Uh, and so whether it's about them per- professionally or personally, if it's stuff that you can find on LinkedIn, I think that's all fair game. The next thing on the FBI list is also find out who they know. So not only do you get, need to get to know who they are, but who they know. Oh, so I, you know, I saw in this former company, you work with someone I know. Commonality and having that missing link, you know, it's like finding the fossil that links, you know, two types of uh, <laughs> Uh, of lost species and it's the missing link where that connects them often having a commonality of having someone you both have in common can really break the ice and give it a a sense of a deeper meaning relationship right off the bat because you have somebody in common and again linkedin is a great uh, resource for that finding out who you have in common, who you've worked with together in the past, what projects, what companies you have you both worked in or you know people who work there. So really f- uh, focusing on knowing who they know is really important. The other thing is knowing everything about the company that you're going to be talking to, even if it doesn't directly relate to the negotiations. Uh, you know, their product, their services, locations, their company structure, and on and on and on. I'll give you a, pr- an, a perfect example about four or five years ago, one of my marketing people said, hey, there's this other company that wants to partner up with you because you have some commonality. They do something that overlaps with what you do. Would you be able, you know, do you want to take a meeting with them? And I thought, well, yeah, why not? You know, good, yeah, couldn't hurt. Why not? Let's hear them out. What? Let's see what they have in mind. And I remember, uh, you know, we met in a conference room in our office and they walked in very nice and we had some pleasantries. Hello, how are you? And they started the conversation with, hey, can you tell us about you, meaning us? And I really was thrown back because, I mean, they were coming to me. They were the ones setting up the meeting. And then they were asking me to explain what we do. So, you know, I took a lesson from that. You know, if I'm going to go meet with someone, it's my job, especially if I'm calling for the meeting. It's my job to investigate their company, what they do, what their services are, how they do business as much as I can. So when I arrive, all that information is already there and we can talk about higher level stuff of how we can negotiate together. So really when you go to a meeting to negotiate, don't make the other person read their website to you. Uh, literally at the meeting about what they do or how many locations they have or how many states they're located in. You should already know that. And if you do know that, you know, that's going to convey how professional you are and it's going to convey how important this meeting is to you and how important they are to you, right? So do your homework, okay? And not just, you know, on your cell phone while you're in the waiting room before the meeting. Take an hour or two and just plow through a lot of material Um, Sometimes maybe even more than that, okay? One of the other cool things is really if you can try to get to know their competitors. So it's a very interesting phenomenon because when you go into a meeting and they start maybe saying how great they are, you know, if you really want to score some points, say, yeah, as a matter of fact, I know your competitors don't do that because blah, 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 blah. It, again, conveys the sense of professionalism, that you care, that you're a serious person, and you value them and you take them seriously. I hope you like this. Please comment, like, and subscribe. If you've had your own individual experience, to share that with me. As usual, thank you very much and have an amazing day. Thank you.